Okay, you've seen ChatGPT write code. You've seen Midjourney create stunning images. You've probably even asked AI to summarize an email or help with a caption. But what if I told you the most important shift in AI isn't happening on your screen at all? It's happening all around us, in our kitchen, in our bedroom, in our garage. You see, AI is quietly escaping the digital world and entering the physical one. And I find this so fascinating because this is truly the foundation of the next decade we are going to see tech move into. And most people haven't even noticed it yet or are really not speaking about it. So let's really dive into what is this shift. Most people still think of AI as something that lives on their phone, on their computer. I mean, you type in a message, you tap a button, and you get a response, a chatbot. But this is changing and changing fast. We're really entering an era of spatial and embodied AI. But what does this exactly mean? Okay, spatial AI understands 3D space. It knows what's around it, where your furniture is, how you move through a room, even things such as, I don't know, objects that are in relation to each other. Embodied AI actually goes a step further. It can actually act in that space. So we're talking about AI with a body, not just a metaphorical one something robotic with wheels, arms, sensors, cameras. And this is a really big shift into how AI interacts with the world because it's moving from thinking to actively doing, you know, from things such as answering questions passively to helping you in your day-to-day -day life. I mean, this is already happening. Let's go through some examples of this. I think that is a really great way to kind of lean into this topic. Let's start with tech that's already in our homes. So let's say something like Narwhal. Okay, but the most important shift in tech, it's not happening on your screen. It's happening in your home. Okay, check this out. This is the Narwhal flow. And yes, it's a robot moth, but it's also a glimpse into how AI is quietly moving into the real world. So check this out. Instead of smearing messes like most robot moths that I've tried, the Narwhal's flow wash system uses hot water, 113 degrees Fahrenheit to be exact, and 12 newtons of pressure to actually dissolve stains all in one pass. I mean, it scrapes off grime and sends the dirty water into its own sealed tank, which is pretty cool. And unlike other robot vacuums where the mop just gets dirtier the longer it runs, the flow wash system will keep the mop clean throughout the entire job. And while you're doing literally anything else, it's heading back to its all-in-one base, where it enters into a four-step self-cleaning cycle that does washing, drying, and sanitizes the mop to kill bacteria. I mean, this AI system can detect and avoid over 200 household objects in real time. Things like cords, shoes, pet bowls, Mr. Mugs, without bumping, pausing, or rerouting your entire day. It cleans edges within a centimeter. And one thing I really love is it actually will get into corners where other bots will give up. It even features a fully tangle-free roller brush system, so you're not constantly cutting out hair or threads, which was my biggest challenge in the past. And when it hits the carpet, it lifts the mop automatically to avoid moisture damage. Then it will kick into carpet max mode with double pass zigzag cleaning and sealed airflow suction. And as a side note, it's very satisfying to watch, oddly. Okay, other things it can do though, it can even climb thresholds up to 1.6 inches, which means it doesn't get stuck halfway into a room. This is what ambient AI looks like. Invisible, intelligence, and helpful. And it's already here, which is really cool and i love this example of it if you want to see how this fits into your home check out the link below also thanks to narwhal for sponsoring today's video okay let's go into another example let's take apple vision pro it's not just a headset it understands your physical environment in real time where your eyes are gazing your gestures i mean even the layout of your room when you pinch your fingers, you're clicking, you're looking around at something and it's becoming interactive. And this isn't just virtual reality we're talking, it's spatial computing. Another good example would be Meta's Ray-Ban smart glasses. I mean, they have built an AI that can recognize objects, translate text on signs, or even describe what you're seeing, which I love. I love those glasses, by the way. You're literally wearing an AI that understands the world with you together. These are some examples of interfaces that are a new type of intelligence, the ones that lives in our world, not just on our screens per se. We can interact with, we can collaborate with. So why now? Why is this shift happening now? Well, in my opinion, there are three big reasons. First, sensors and computing power have become cheap. A LiDAR sensor that used to cost thousands and thousands of dollars now fits into, say, a thousand dollar robot vacuum. Or say, the depth sensing camera that once required a full rig now fits into a smartphone. The physical components that make spatial awareness possible are now accessible to consumers. Second, AI models have become multimodal. This means they don't just understand text. They can process images, video, 
depth and motion. Google DeepMind's RT-2 model is a great example of this. I mean, it can take visual data and understand human instructions, things such as pick up the blue cup. Now I know when they first launched it, there was some, you know, they might have uh, made the video look a little bit more better than it actually was capable of, but now it's really good. I mean, this is language perception and action working together. And third is Edge AI. I am obsessed with Edge AI. I think it's really going to continue to advance a lot of our, our robotics and AI uh, systems. I mean, it's just, it's incredible what it's possible of, capable of. Edge AI essentially means these models can now run directly on your device, whether it's going back to Meta's pair of glasses, a vacuum, a headset, without constantly needing the cloud. And why this is so key is because it makes everything faster, also more private and more reliable. So these three forces, if you will, together, cheaper hardware, smarter models and on-device processing have all really converged at the right time. And together, they are what is making physical AI possible. Okay, but then it brings up the next question. Where is this heading? I mean, we're talking a little bit about examples in our home, but where else is this heading? Well, for one, Amazon's a great example of this. They use over 750,000 autonomous robots to move inventory. They're not following just pre-programmed paths either. They're actually coordinating with each other. They're dynamically adjusting routes and navigating around people or objects. Another good example would be hospitals. Robots like Moxie deliver medications, lab samples, and supplies, which really frees up nurses to spend more time with patients. These aren't just simple delivery bots, you see. They're really navigating complex environments. Some of them can even use elevators or interact with staff. Okay, my dad's a farmer, so I need to farm an agriculture example. In agriculture, robots like Carbon Robotics Laser Weeder, it's a kind of a mouthful, but it's really cool, use computer vision to identify individual weeds and then destroy them with lasers. That sounds so fi science fiction. Dramatically, this is reducing the needs for pesticides, which is huge if you know any farmers. And in factories like say Sanctuary AI or Figure AI, which I really wanna to get to, they are developing humanoid robots that can perform general purpose tasks using tools, opening doors, or even folding laundry, which is the, the biggest win in my opinion. I mean, these systems are already being tested too by companies like BMW and Magna. You see, the world is being quietly filled with machines that can see, think, and act. I mean, these are things that we don't really think about on a day-to-day, -day, but they are all around us. And that brings me to the next point, which is why does this matter? Why now? I think the biggest thing is because it really changes our relationship with technology. I mean, for the past 50 years, we've had to learn how to use computers. We've learned to type. We've learned to swipe. We've even learned to speak the language of machines. I mean, learning code. But spatial and embodied AI really flips this around because now the machine learns how to understand you. You point, you speak, you gesture, and the AI responds in the way a person might. This is what makes technology accessible in a way that it never has been. It really changes everything. You don't need to know how to code. You don't even need a screen. You just need to interact naturally with the world around you. And the machine is responsible for figuring it out. And I mean, that's huge for people who've been left out of the digital world. People maybe not tech savvy, such as elders or people intimidated by complex technology. Because this is tech where it meets you where you really are. And it's Beyond accessibility, I mean, this opens up physical assistance, for example, with the elderly. I mean, AI can now help elder care, home cleaning, food prep, and so much more, which is huge when you think about people who might have not been leaning on technology prior. This is things that used to require people to come into the home and help out. Now we can have tech do that. And also too, on that note, you might be like, oh, well, they're gonna lose that human touch. A lot of people can't afford to have a cleaner come in to clean their home, uh, to fix their, their repairs, whatever it is. I'm not a construction person, but you know what I mean? And now that they can have these robots come in or rent these robots even to come in at a cheaper price, it's really enabling them to hopefully have a better quality of life for the things that they need done around the house. I mean, listen, it still has a long way to go. AI still struggles with a lot of different environments. Uh, I mean, for example, a robot does great in a lab. It might fail in a cluttered apartment. Safety is also something really big to consider. When AI is controlling machines in physical spaces, the consequences of making a mistake are serious, real world risks. So rolling this out is taking longer than say, rolling out a chatbot, of course. I mean, Safety, 
Privacy is another one. When your devices are seeing, hearing, and learning everything about your home, about you as a person, where does this data go? I know with edge computing, edge AI, it stays on the device, but once it gets to a certain point, it needs to go to the cloud. So these are questions we're only really navigating now for the first time, and that is why I hope anyways, the rollout of this will be a bit slower, but it's happening. And it's not something that a lot of people are talking about. So if you are in tech, working in tech, or just curious about tech, this is an area where I would highly suggest spending some of your time because I think over the next year to five years, we're gonna see some major computing with spatial and embodied AI uh, changes and modifications, and I'm really excited to, to be a part of it. All right, I went on a little ramble there, but I think it's really important just to have a candid conversation about this, where this tech is headed. Okay, make sure to hit that subscribe button for more future tech, AI, coding, all the good stuff. Leave in the comments what other, what other type of videos you want me to make, and I'll see you all soon. Thanks, everyone.